Today we're hearing about um, corvids and how clever they are. So that's a, again a really interesting bird topic because today I forgot to mention is of course Bird Observers Day and uh, it is why we've got such a lot of lovely lot of bird lovers here today to listen. So uh, could I ask you please to put your hands together to welcome our guest speaker today, Daryl Jones. Let's just test whether that thing works really well. Goodness gracious. <laughs> it's very loud. Um, that, geez, can you turn it down a bit? Because I'm going to have a loud, that loud voice naturally. Wow, I've never been hooked up like this before. This is, this is cool. Um, thanks very much for having me back. Um, yes, as, as mentioned by, um, by earlier about the, the book. Now, I talked to you about bird feeding. There's a book. Uh, and it's, I'm just looking at the proofs right now, so I, at the time I thought, why don't I come up here and launch it up here? And I'm going to, so I don't win. You'll have to buy a copy. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say was, um, I was going to mention Adani, you don't need to, fantastic. Look, let me just commend you on that. On that. That's something incredibly important for the whole, the future of this, of this planet, seriously. Um, one of the things that I've done some research, well, I do all sorts of research on all sorts of things, but one of them was we were trying to figure out what is it that, that politicians take notice of when they're making decisions to do with environmental stuff. Uh, and we actually looked at all the different types of different things that they use. Is it scientific studies like I do? Is it the newspapers? Is it journalists? Is it pressure groups? Is it whatever? And I just wanted to say that the absolutely clearest version of the clearest influence we have on what changes politicians' decisions, what's the most influential thing? Well-organised community groups. So every community group that I've ever spoken to or belong to all said no one listens to us. They listen to you. And so do what Rod said. Well done, Rod. That's fantastic. Okay, I'm going to talk about clever crows. No, that says corvids. And the reason I've got a weird looking crow up there is because it's not just about those blackbirds that go ah, ah, ah. There's a lot of them in this group. And so this is to kind of, oh, this is unite your average. I give a lot of talks about crows and they're always to a very different audience. Usually people going like this. <laughs> when are you gonna get rid of the bloody crows type, type audience? I don't think that's everybody in the room. So what I'd like to do is just tell you just some extraordinary stuff that's going on with this too familiar bird that we don't even take any notice of. Let's, let's have a look at this. Um, here's the group. So this is just a bunch of them that we, so you can see what they are. So it's the jays, crows, ravens, the magpie that we're going, and the reason I had the magpie, so that's the red button. So that's the European magpie. In this particular case, it's the black-billed magpie from North America, but it's the same one that, and you're, they feature strongly in this because there's been a lot of research done on them. They don't look like crows, but they're corvid. So I'm using the word corvid for anything in this group. Most of the research has been done on the black ones, but that's no, no problem. But you'll see a few things that are familiar to you there. Um, the, the standard thing when you talk about birds, and everybody's heard this, you know, you're a bit of a bird brain kind of stuff. We're seriously re reassessing that, uh, that particular perspective. I, I don't know whether they were looking at chooks or something, but. You know, the, I don't know, I, you know, I tried to actually find the origins of the bird brain phrase, what, you know, because it obviously conveys stupidity or dumbness or something like that. And I'm not saying anything about emus, let me just make that clear. <clears throat> so I do study brush turkeys and look, I'm their biggest fan and I don't think they're very smart. <laughs> so this is to challenge this. This is the research that I'm about to tell you in this little talk is really challenges that whole concept and that's where we're starting. Um, once upon a time it was thought that we didn't have, the, the really smart bit of the brain is the blue bit, the cerebral um, hemisphere, and birds don't have a big one of those, but they have a different perspective, and I'm not going to go into any details, but these are the, these are the animals which are regarded, I got this from the web, a very crude phylogeny of really smart animals, that's not very technical, but these are the types of things where studying has been going on. Elephants, dolphins, um, all the, the primates that includes us, corvids and parrots. Corvids and parrots are absolutely the smartest birds by far. So when it comes to smart birds, they're the, they're the key ones. And I'm not going to mention them today, but there's been some fantastic work done on 
He is from New Zealand. Seriously smart. Seriously mischievous, naughty bird, my goodness. They know exactly how to stir us up. So, but that's just to tell you the point. We've got a different shaped brain, a different structured brain, and it's and it, because it was different, it, the usual story, if it's different, it must be bad. No, this is different and it's just as good. They just have a different way of doing things. Um, these are the, this is a, not a very particular uh, accurate diagram because it, you might think that there's equal things, but each of the features that come up, the zebra finch, mice, humans, zebra finches, zebra fish and zebra finches, I wonder if there's anything going on there, crows, parrots, chickens and drosophila and, and a little tiny little worm top thing. Believe it or not, those are the species where most of the cognition, the use of the brain, the understanding, if you like, intelligence testing has been done around the world in the, in the world of animals. Um, but up the front there, so it's not accurate because absolutely, you know, ninety-nine percent of the, the cognition stuff has been done on humans. But this is just to tell you, there's been a lot of work done on a remarkable array of animals in terms of how smart they are and what tests they can do and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so this is summarises the talk. It's really just saying here's a here's a bird that can do all sorts of things. It can memor memorise things from for years to come. It can do spatial recognition, it can remember words, it can do all sorts of things. This, is the, this should be the last slide because it just says, who are you calling a bird brain? I can do all kinds of stuff. Let's just explore some of those details. But first of all, let's just talk about who the, who the Corvididae are. That's the name of the family, about 120 species, found all over the world, apart from the really cold bits up the top. New Zealand, no corvids. Um, they've got some introduced corvids there. Um, there's the rooks from New England were taken there and they're doing okay. And the southern bit of New so uh, southern bit of South America, but basically crows, corvids, uh, everywhere. Um, and just to give you some of the what they look like. So here is the smallest corvid, which is the pygmy jay from Mexico. It's a little tiny bird. It's only 20, um, 40 grams. Um, as to contrast to the biggest corvid, which is the a uh, thick build raider, which is a uh, 1.6 kilograms. That's a big, serious bird. So, uh, a Theresian crow, the local crow, weighs about 200. So imagine how much bigger that one is. Uh, and look at that beak. That's just extraordinary what I think. And they're not all just black and horrible looking. Um, here's a beautiful one from um, from Brazil, the plush crested jay, a very rare bird. But that's kind of an average size bird. So. It's really not just these black birds that I really want to try and get that across to you. Um, and I just want to, just in case anybody's confused here, um, we've got, when our European forebears arrived and the naturalists started looking around at the birds and they saw the black and white ones and they said, ooh, black and white, magpie, because that's basically what magpie means. And so our non corvid magpie got named magpie and it's only because it's got a bit of black and white on it and this is a real magpie, this is the European magpie, um, and you can see they're black and white and they must have been very, very low intelligence and not much imagination the day they did that. I'm sure there's a fantastic Aboriginal word for magpies and it's a bit late probably because everybody knows the magpie. Anyway, I just wanted to push that arrow because I also study magpies in a big way as well. So let's just quickly, I just want to quickly go through, we've got five well, really six, because uh, I'm not going to mention the sixth one, which is the house crow, which keeps turning up in some of our ports, like Darwin and Perth, every now and again, and they vanish without a trace. Nobody knows what happens to them. They come on, come on ships, and then we're trying to keep them out. We don't want any more crows. But we've got five, so this is just a quick, quick thing. So here we are here, somewhere up here. This is where the little crows live. This is where the little ravens live, so you know, southern New South Wales and Victoria, basically. This is where the forest ravens live. So there's a bunch of them up in the New England area, but basically they're in the really cold mountainous bits and Tasmania. So they're, they're big. So we've got crows and ravens in, us, in Australia. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's completely meaningless. Typically from the European naturalists who would have named them originally, the bigger ones were the ravens and the smaller ones were the crows. And that's about it. And they are slightly different. They're slightly bigger, but you'd never know. You know. But the, 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 the Tasmanian, Tasmanian version of the forest raven is a pretty big bird, but it's nowhere near as big as the European raven, which we'll get to in a moment. 
Uh, the Australian raven, which eats a lot of tennis ball, I mean uh, golf ball, and you can see where it goes. So it's it coincides a fair bit with the Theresian crow, a local crow, because it goes right up in central Queensland there. And then our crow, you know, this is the local crow. So we, there is, I keep hearing about the possibility that another, uh, the Australian ravens sometimes turn up on the coast. I don't know whether the birdies, birdos in the group are aware of that. Every now and again, there's a, a sighting so-called in Brisbane, but I don't believe most of them, um, because they're based only on calls. They're really hard to tell apart. So this is our crow, and that's what we're going to talk about. I, I've, I've done a lot of research on crows on these guys, and we'll get to that towards the end of the, walk, end of the talk. So let's just cruise through this. So the first thing I wanted to mention was the vocalisations. Vocalisations? Um, don't they just go, ah, or variations on that theme? Uh, yes, they do, and that's called the core. So their primary word, if you like, or it's probably better to call it a syllable, is the car and or core. And it varies, but everybody knows what a, a typical crow syllable like, ah, 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 you know, all that sort of stuff. And you think, well, that's just the same old thing. So and that's the raven's call. And that's, a, that's the big raven, so you probably saw these at the Tower of London last time you were there, unless you got your head chopped off. Um, but this, this, so this was studied, the, the, the first big um, vocalisation studies was done on, on ravens, and then American crows, and then more latterly on the Australian Theresian crows. Um, and th that's just what they look like, and it's a pretty straightforward low, low frequency call. But what, that's, the, that's the syllable, so when we talk, if you like, it, you, you could regard it as a word. So the core is the word. So, and so people have looked at how many core, you know, what's the vocabulary of different crow species? And there's various ones. And this guy has about 30. Oh, I think I've got that up there. No, no. This, um, so the European or North American raven, same species that's run across the top of the world, has about 30 cores with different types of words, all like a ah, not noise. But it's how they put them into series, and the series is the sentence. So if you can actually have enough words, you can make a sentence, and you can actually com communicate very com complex types of things. And so they think that there's about 30 or so cores in their vocabulary, and they have about 50 series, right? And that's been, so they are uh, able to establish what some people are even suggesting is a language. Now, we can't hear it, and we certainly don't know what it means. But all of that, uh, 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 and uh, you, anybody that's spent any time looking at Theresian crows, they talk to them each other all the time. They make a whole variety of different calls. Now, I'm, the, all the work that's at the moment, it, it appears that the vocabulary, the language, if you like, of the Theresian crow is all about... Um, the cores. There's a whole lot of other words and no noises that they make, but we're not talking about those. One of the things that, so that's it, so what I'm saying about 30 different words in their language and about 50 different sentence structures that they've got. We don't know what they mean. Right, so that's where it goes. But one of the things that they've discovered is um, they, were, they were looking at these, 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 so these are ravens living in the freezing cold parts of Maine in, in, uh, in America. And what they, what they noticed was the corvids would go out and they, if they found a dead moose in the, in the woods or a, a run over deer on the, on the side of the road, um, they, would, they would, it's always a bit, tri a bit, you're a bit, it's a bit dangerous if you're just by yourself or with, just with your partner because crows pretty, pretty much always spend all their time in the, as a pair. Um, and, if, and it's dangerous because of predators and all sorts of things. You don't want to be caught out by yourself. So what you find, if, you, if you're, a, if you're a, a raven living in North America, you want to have as many other, and, and it's a big, big, big meal. You want to share it. Actually, this is a, there's enough to share, but you want to have as many other friends with you as you possibly can so that somebody's looking after the predators at any stage. And so they have, they have now, they've called out, they call it the yell. So a pair turns up, dead moose, wow, oh, dangerous, could be... Coyotes, there could be wolves, there could be hunters. We need somebody to look out for us while we're doing, while we're feeding. We need a bunch of friends. So they have a thing called the yell. And they will yell 
and then we'll, and that's the, that literally says over here, fantastic food, come and join us. And and that's been you know that you, you can record that call and broadcast it, and and Ravens will turn up going yeah 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 where 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 you know and we we've, we've done a bit of that sort of stuff as well. So that's that's tell you know that so we can't it actually hear it. It just sounds different, but obviously it's interpreted by the other ravens in a very sophisticated way. So where are we going? I'm slowly makes progressing to this. We're getting somewhere with this, don't worry. We're getting somewhere. Um, then, so a student of mine, Matt Brown, decided to look at the same thing. He used it exactly the same standard techniques that have been used in American crows and ravens and a bunch of other species. 87 cores. The local Theresian crow has 87 cores at least. And 230 series. Now, according to all of the the ways that the people who study language and cognition says that qualifies as true language. If you've got 230 sentences in your vocabulary, you can tell your friends, your other crow friends, an enormous amount. An enormous amount. And they spend around about 60% of every day, they call at least once a minute. So 60, they're chatting, they're discussing, they're philosophizing, they're probably turning about, you know, wondering when they're, how they're going to run the world when the humans have all gone. I mean, they're up to something. I, I'm going to put out a keyboard one day, a whole laptop, and just stand back and see what they do. Because, uh, and so this is, this is what Matt did. Some people think this is a bit boring. Here is the, this is just the first of the 230 series that he came up with. He's giving them a number um, and all sorts of other things. And this one, this is the first one. It's it's the commonest one, it's the ak, 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 ak call. You've probably heard that. And that's, a, that's the really common call. And he says that's the, where are you, I'm here, where are you, I'm here. And they're all doing it in, so they're all sitting around in a tree somewhere or on a, down on the ground foraging. And they're just saying, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here. And they're all doing that so they all know where each other is. We have no idea what any of these things mean. But I'm, I'm happy, I, one of the things about studying animal behaviour is it makes you humble. You realise we haven't got a clue. We haven't got a clue. And I'm never for a moment going to say they don't know what we're saying. We'll get, get to that later. So they have language. So first, first big, big thing, done in Brisbane just a couple of years ago, the most, well, the really, really, I'm sure that somebody's going to come up with uh, the next species that's got the largest vocabulary, but this is the largest vocabulary of any bird so far today. Theresian crows, your crows, the ones out there, that's, they've got, they're talking about us right now. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, so maybe these crows are worth studying. They look like they've got an interesting brain. They, um, well, we could do some of these other studies that have been done on things like gorillas or all sorts of stuff. So there's the mirror test. So the mirror test is, is a, a, probably one of the fundamental cognition studies. Um, it's test, if you like. What do, does an animal do when it, when it sees its reflection in a mirror? All right? What does a magpie like do when it sees its reflection in your side mirror in the car? It attacks it. It thinks it's a different bird. It's in the middle of its territory, and so it doesn't recognise what it is. It knows that it's another, spe another member of its own species. And so it attacks it because it's, what the hell are you doing in my... And it's still there, and it's still there, and I beat it really hard, and it hurts when I beat it. Oh, you know, gee, you can fight back really well. So, so that's one reaction. Another reaction is, what on earth is that? I just don't understand. Um, gorillas know exactly what it is, and they just go, is it my left side? <laughs> um, or they, they just are mesmerised. So we did lots of studies on this. I'm not going to show you the data, I'll just tell you what we found. But um, Theresian crows do exactly what you would expect, but we'll get there in a moment. What we did was we put out um, lots of mirrors and we put cameras on them uh, to see what the birds do. So we set it all up, a camera. We knew birds lived in the area. We put a little bit of bait in front of the mirror. Uh, and then we just put the camera on and leave because crows can tell. One of the things we discovered very early on in our studies was that you can't 
be there. The crows watch what you do. I mean, I've many times I've caught, tried unsuccessfully to catch crows with all sorts of apparatus, spent hours and hours trying to come up with really, really clever traps. And then I look up and there's a crow as they're going, oh, oh okay. And then that won't go anywhere near me. So, we, honestly, I could tell you a whole sort of stories about how we can't catch crows, but we won't go there. Um, the, this particular bird proved not to be highly cognition savvy, really. So we, we had one study where we put out the thing for 23 days, and for the 10 hours of the day, for 23 days, one of those birds stood there pecking at itself. <laughs> so one of the other things about cognition is learning. <laughs> no. No. Not, no. So I'm not going to put the pigeon group up with the parrots or the porpoise. Here's a famous study. So here's a mirror test with um, a corbett. So this is our European uh, magpie again. So here it is. It's been, this is, it's, it's a wild bird that's been tamed, so it hasn't been raised in captivity. It's been brought in, given food, settled down, and spent a long time in captivity, but it's still a wild bird. Here it is confronted by itself in the mirror. What will it do? So it seemed to recognise itself. So what they did, well, they, they couldn't prove this for sure, but one of the things you can do is they put a red dot under here, under, just underneath here, so it can't see that. And they did, they, they, this was truly just, what, I wonder what it would do, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't recognise itself. And so they put a red dot here that the bird can't see, and then put it in front of the mirror, and it just went, what's this red dot here? I.e., that's me in the mirror. That's me. So, where'd that red dot come from? It's on my beautiful black throat. I mean, that's terrible. I mean, and so they interest in, in, instantly understood that that was self-recognition. Now, self-recognition in a mirror is limited to a very small number of animals on that list, or anything that revolves, that we regard as a smart, highly cognition savvy type of animal has self-recognition, self and of course, so did the trees and crow. They knew immediately that what they were. And they're really interesting because they just went, oh yeah, you know, that's me, that's a mirror, what's the big deal, you know? Um, whereas the gorillas actually spend a lot of time looking at each other, looking at themselves. Well, they're, 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 they're primates, so they're going to be self-obsessed. <laughs> okay, another thing that we do is neophobia. So neophobia technically means fear of something new. There's something going around in the world about the fear of new, but that's a different thing. That's not what we're talking about. So here is a, this is a, a really classical test of animal behaviour. So here is um, a captive uh, great tit by the looks of it. And it's, there, it's, it's in captivity and there is its food and this thing turns up. So it's never seen one of those things before. It's just a Mr. Gumby. You know, Mr. Gumby has a horse. That's Mr. Gumby's horse. What's that called? I don't know. Probably. What's that? Pokey. Pokey. Pokey the horse. Okay. If that's what it is. <laughs> Who knows? And so the, it, this is put in there. The bird is completely familiar with all the other parts of its parts of its uh, it, its little cap captive world. And then the horse thing turns up, and it's never seen one before. And so it doesn't know what to do, and it refuses to eat. And so we did exactly the same thing with the crows. So the crows. So this is a test of neophobia. How long does it take to overcome the neophobic reaction? So when things are new in your your world, you either just that's new, I don't know what it is, I'll fear it just in case. Or do I quickly work out that it's not a danger and then overcome that neophobia? And so this is a yet another cognition test to see how smart animals are. You don't want to be too neophobic, especially if you live in an urban environment. So if you've moved into the city with people, there are new things all the time. If you're going to be worried about new stuff, you're not going to be able to get on and make a, make a living. You're just going to be worried about everything all the time. So that's what we tested, basically, with these urban crows in Brisbane. Um, so the crows were okay. They, the crows are very neophobic, but they're not fear-driven. So they went, oh, that's a bit strange. And what the crows did was wait, and they let these guys move straight in. Okay, so the, we didn't expect these to be there. I mean, they were always there. But if you put out food and when it's... when you when you're baiting, what truly wild. So one of the other things that 
all of, nearly all the studies that were, have been done on, on animal cognition, most of them have, especially all the ones on corvids, have been done on captive birds. We tried to do it, we did it, we did it ours on truly wild birds, we didn't take them into it. So we were always looking at wild birds that could come and go, not ones that have been in any way influenced by humans. So, but of course, you put out a bit of meat and the butcher birds turn up instantly. And so we thought, okay, we'll, we'll scare them away by putting one of these type things, we made it out of pipe cleaners, it was just a weird looking shape. But it was new, it was new in their world. And they went, ah, pipe cleaner. Bugger, you know, and they just walked in and ate the food that we put out to the crows. And so did the, the, um, the pied butcher birds, they, the, the uh, pied currawongs. So pied butcher birds and pied currawongs had very little neophobia. What was very interesting though, was the first seven trials, the crows, they came close and they went, they walked around the food, they walked around the food, but they wouldn't go near. Until they saw these guys do it. And they learned from the reactions of the other species. So here's another, another evidence, more evidence, that these are very smart animals. Most animals only react to the, to the reactions or the behaviour of the same members of the same species. Crows are able to identify what's going on and interpret the behaviour of other animals or other species in their world. And so they overcame their neophobia very quickly when they saw that these guys weren't being harmed by that new thing that was in their world. So that's a very interesting thing. So um, Teresian crows are very neophobic, but they overcome that through the process of learning by observations of other animals. All right, probably, so this is, okay, they're looking smart, what else can you do? So probably one of the most classical um, things is called the, 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 the string pull test. And it basically it's a form of in order to get the meat, the crow has to pull something. It's got to use something else, a tool, if you like. And this is just a, a string suspended from a branch with the meat on the bottom of it. But in order to get the meat, they've got to use something else, and they've got to use the string. And so they pull the string up like this. And so they learn how quickly do they learn to do it. So we did this with wild crows. It took a while for them to overcome, because this is new. You don't normally see bits of meat on pieces of string. So it took quite a while for them to get used to it and think, oh, that is me, right, okay, let's, let's work it out. Um, and so what they did was, the Teresian crows took 17 trials before they actually successfully, so it took, you know, they, they land, we, we, a trial was when they landed on the branch and obviously were interested in the meat. And they'd land and, and then they'd go into the ground and try and fly up and did all sorts of things. So the, 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 crow, the crows eventually did it, they successfully, they were successful in their in their, uh, in their trial, they took 17 trials, which is around about what we expected. It's about the same as kids and about the same as other crow species. But the currawongs were there as well. The currawongs were there doing the same thing. Now, we're not trying to study currawongs. Currawongs and butcher birds are not corvids. Hey, what are you doing? We know that you're not smart, we thought. <laughs> so the pirate currawongs took nine trials, but the pie butcher birds <laughs> took three trials. So don't look, you know, we're trying, we're in the world of trying to prove just how smart crows are, and these non-crows are coming in and spoiling the party. So just as a little aside, we've got a whole lot of other research now going on on butcher birds, which no one's ever suspected because they're not corvids. Includes magpies. Includes magpies. Yes, because magpies basically there's yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. So we're going to say, okay, the West, rest of the world has got crows. Excellent, you just keep studying your crows. We're Australian researchers and we're going to look at some neglected Aussie species and we're, they're, they're actually killing it. They're, they're smashing this, these tests really well. But anyway, back to the crows. Back to the crows. So these are, these are all studies that have been done you know, in, in certain circumstances and people are understanding them and, 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 and you know, they're coming to the conclusion, ah, oh, pretty smart these birds, pretty smart. They can even do, they can work out the spring, the string pull test pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, that's all right. And then a guy from New Zealand who was studying a very odd bird on New Caledonia, the kagu. Have you ever, ever seen the kagu? It's K-A-G-U. It's a big, flightless, strange looking bird and according to the person who, I've forgotten his name, but I know him really well and he'll be so disappointed with this. So am I. Gary, someone. 
from the Auckland, New Auckland University. Um, I met him because, you know, we crow people talk to each other um, in English. Uh, and he said, I said, because he made this discovery about the New Caledonian crows. And he said, I said, so what about the cargo? And he said, the most boring bird in the world. And so he was sitting around in the forests of New Caledonia, waiting for cargo to do anything. And then he noticed um, New Caledonian crows. In every other way, just a crow. A black bird that goes, ah, 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 nothing unusual, except they were carrying around hooked tools and using them in all sorts of ways. They were manufacturing tools. They make, and you're on average, an adult to read, um, New Caledonian crow makes 13 to 20 tools every month and carries them around with them and uses them for different purposes. Absolutely the most advanced tool use of any species apart from humans, even chimpanzees. They're using more tools and all the animals in the whole community over there know how to use these things. And so they use the tools for all kinds of things. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. And I invite you, if you've got access to uh, you know, YouTube or anything, just Google New Caledonian Crow and there is a hundred different things you can see them doing extraordinary stuff. This, they've even done this, this study. So Aesop's crow, so one of the Aesop's fables is the crows went to a jar that was, um, had something that they wanted to eat in it. I've forgotten what it was, walnuts or something? I can't remember what it was. Sorry? They wanted a drink. Wanted a drink. That's right, I wanted a drink. That's right. And so how can they drink that's too much water? They can't put their head down, so they put stones into it. Well, the New Caledonian know all, all about that. They did all about that. They, they put... They put meat in there at the bottom of the tube uh, and they did exactly the same thing. They raised the level of the water in, in exactly the same way. And I'm pretty sure they hadn't read the fable. <laughs> now, at this stage, all of this New Caledonian crow work had been done in New, Cal New Caledonia. This, this was a New Caledonian crow that they caught, tamed a little bit, put, kept in a cage, but they haven't done anything else. But the people, a bunch of people from Oxford University thought, I wonder how innate this is. is this, are they just natural? Are they just learning from one another? Is it, are they just really good at learning? We know that corvids are fantastic at learning and observing from one another. Hmm, what about if we take a baby crow that has never seen anybody else and take it to England? This is Henrietta, I think her name is. So she was taken, I think she was three days old when they took her to England, poor thing, from New Caledonia to um, Oxford. And they put her in a trial they, when, she was, when she was about eight months old. She's just a crow, a baby crow that's never even seen another three, um, New Caledonian crow at all. They put, this is an advanced level, but they put a tube with some meat in the bottom of it and left a whole bunch of things around. It took 13 hours for Henrietta to go, meat in the bottom of the tube, there's a bit of wire, 13 hours, made a hook and got the, got the thing out. Now, that's beyond chimps, that's beyond 12-year-old, 7-year-old uh, humans, that's smart. And that's just been the beginning of it. So, this is, this, honestly, this is like utterly revolutionary. All the crow people, but anybody in animal behaviour got aware of this very, very soon. This is a, a classic, in, in, this, in my world, if you get a paper in nature, you know, you've made it to basically knighthood sort of stuff. And so this young bloke who was studying cargo is on the cover of nature with, with his bird. So that's another thing worth having a look at. Um, and so it's gone on from there. So here is, this is this one's called the, the three tool thing. So I'll just explain how that works. So here is the meat, but it's in a glass box and you can't get at it. It's too skinny for the bird to reach in. Um, here is a string, so it's a classic string, and there's one tool. Got to use that tool because the string, the tool that you need to get the meat out of there is a long piece of stick. This is a short piece of stick, so the crow has got to look at that and go, I want to get that meat, I've got to get that tool to, use, to, get, to put it inside those things to get that big tool out and then I can use it to stab the meat. Okay, pretty astounding. Currently they're up to eight stage type things. So there is, to, in order for the crow to go, I want to get that thing hidden in that place over there, I've got to get that thing first, and then that, and then that, and then that, and then that, eight stages. We are just 
are getting a bit scared about what they're capable of. <laughs> Honestly, you know, this is truly, oh, you know, just amazing. And what, what is extraordinary is these, like the Oxford people had to go to New Caledonia to study these birds. We've got our own crows just out there. I mean, it's, it's an obvious, you know, I, I'm very excited about it and probably it shows, I hope. Okay, so and let's just finish off with some other things. So this is another study, and you may have heard me talking about it on the news, newspaper, on the, on the radio at some stage about magpies, because um, this is a new, this is an American crow in the city of uh, Seattle, and there's a famous guy called John Marsloff, who's a friend of mine, who studies the American crows over there, and he wondered whether they could actually see. Well, what what happened was. They were doing lots of studies on crows and they would go to the nests and take out the birds and band them and all that sort of stuff. And they soon realised that the, crow, the pet adult crows, who didn't like their babies being interfered with by these scientists, would attack them and they'd just follow them around attacking them. And he thought, how do they know who I am, you know? And so they, used, they found themselves wearing masks like this, just a, a bland mask, so that when they wouldn't be able to recognise them as they walked to the university grounds. And then they were, I wonder if it's, you know, if they can actually recognise the facial, facial um, features. So they did a very big experiment, I'm not going to go into the details, but basically they learned very quickly how to recognise, they proved, these guys, they proved that crows are capable of recognising individual humans by their facial features because they changed the facial features all around. And they were able to do that. We've just shown exactly the same thing with Australian magpies. So one of the other things that we have worked on is magpies attacking people, and we got the impression that there was, in some cases, they recognise individuals, and we did exactly the same thing. They know people by themselves. They, magpies live for 20 years or so. They can grow up in the same location. They stay put in one place. They will know every person that lives in their territory. They'll see kids grow up and mature. They'll remember them forever. And we did an experiment, I'm not going to go into details, but. 15 years after the experiment, we went back to that site and, and the student who was 15 years older now got attacked by the magpie that we that originally attacked him 15 years later. And it doesn't attack anybody else, so they, were, they also have long, fantastic memories. All right, and just to finish up, there's some, some other things that show animals to have extraordinary capacity for cognition and learning is um, cultural exchange. Now, back in the day, Looking at this audience, most of you will remember milk bottles like this. So this was, this was, I, I remember them very well, but I don't remember the blue tits getting into them um, because we didn't have any blue tits in Wagga Wagga where I grew up. But this is, this is a, this is a classic thing which was discovered in, uh, in a small town just near Manchester uh, where the blue tits learned that they could peck a hole in the top of the, the um, aluminium foil lid and get the cream, and because it was non pasteurised in those days, so you could drink all the cream out. So everybody would come to get their milk in the morning. Somebody's got into the milk and drunken all the cream, the best bit. So, and and that, that was famous because it, they, they followed the progression, they taught each other the, the they taught each other the offspring of those birds there learned how to do it and they taught their offspring and they taught their offspring and all that sort of stuff. Cultural exchange. Crows? Yes. Crows around Brisbane took around about 15 years to learn how to turn over, well, South East Queensland, how to turn over the cane toads at the peak of the cane toad period when they were absolutely everywhere. And you'll be aware that the cane toads moved very rapidly up and they sort of went throughout coastal Queensland and then stopped and they didn't cut across the Gulf until only about 10 years ago. And then they crossed the Gulf somehow on a wet year, they got across the Gulf and now they're in the Northern Territory and they're moving down the West Australian coast. And that's happened very, very rapidly. What, so I was, not me, but other people from the University of Queensland were studying crow behaviour and they noted, that lots of people said, why don't the crows eat, they eat anything dead on the road, but they weren't, they were eating cane toads and getting sick because that's the whole point of cane toads, they're, they're toxic. So they took a long time to work out how to flip them over and that was studied in quite some detail. Then we went, what happens when the cane toads get to Darwin? The crows up there don't know about this flip thing. They did. They did know exactly as soon as the toads arrived, they would flip them over. So we assume, we can only assume, that this was cultural exchange because it's a continuous distribution of crows all the way through northern Australia. But they told each other, oh, listen, when those cane turn up, here's how you eat them. 
Now, yeah, that's being anthropomorphic <laughs> and an extreme, but something like that is going on. And these birds are smart enough that I'm not, I don't for a minute think that's not, not possible. Okay, and let's just talk about this. We'll finish up now because I'm an urban ecologist. I primarily work in urban areas. I'm really interested in the ways that animals cope with or don't cope with what we do when we clear the build it, clear the trees and put in our houses and gardens and all the other things that we do. Um, so one of the things we discovered at Theresian Crows in Brisbane uh, and all around South East Queensland form very large groups. So Theresian Crows don't form large groups in the bush. They simply don't. The largest average group size would be about 30 anywhere in the bush. And they occur all the way through central Queensland and right up to north Queensland. But in urban areas, they form very large groups and we've got about 20 massive, massive roosts um, which can be up to 500, mag uh, 500 crows. You don't want to live near one of those, that's for sure. Um, and so that, that's all about finding food. So they, and, and we now know that crows, other species, we haven't studied it in this species, but other types of crows exchange information. They, we somehow, with that elaborate, fantastic language they've got, they actually tell each other, I found fantastic food yesterday, they will only tell them if it's a big source of food. It's not a couple of Vegemite sandwiches in the schoolyard, but it might be a dead kangaroo on the road, road or something like that. Um, they tell each other where the food is, and that's one of the reasons they get into large, large flocks. All right, now finish up here. So there's been some interesting things going on with where crows nest. So crows typically nest in a tree, but for a long time now, crows all over the place have been nesting on human structures. So here is one on just some, oh that's probably a top of a, uh, a, a, a yacht um, mast, I think that one is. Or in, in structures, in, in uh, electric, electricity lines and all those kinds of places. But in every case they're away from where people are. Now crows, although they're really smart, it, it showed up in the neophobia. They are really risk averse. They would never do anything like a, 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 a block height, which would just blunder in and get stuck and get hurt, and, but, and they, they don't have any understanding of risk. Whereas the crows are very observant and very careful and will study things carefully. And one of the things that they are, they've never become tame. You know, ibis, for example, will just walk right up to you. Magpies have completely lost their fear of humans. But the crows retain a very serious, strong, even though they've been living among us in the cities for a long time now, they remain very standoffish. You never can get that close to a crow. You know, that, that's, that's for sure. So although they've been working on um, building on structures, they, that, they have never been very close to people. And then, um, about two, no, yeah, two years ago, no, no, last year, so around Brisbane, around my university at Griffith in the camp, Nathan campus, the crows have been there, we've, we've got them all banded, we know them all by, by name now. Um, and we've known that there's been, there was a young couple who was fairly useless. And I'm in this big new building, and it just went up about four years ago. And for every year for four years, this pair would come along and put, you know, three sticks here, and on every level of this six-storey building, I'll put three sticks and seven over here and we're like, what are you doing? You know, they had no idea. They, they, some instinct was saying, put sticks down for breeding. And they, and they, and they, they put the sticks down and they were, what now? You know, they, just, they just didn't get it. Then last year, they built a nest. They built a nest. Now the problem is, so let me just go, or go skip, skip to the point. <laughs> this fancy new building of mine has got glass walls. Right, so they're on the outside on the, on the ledge, on the ledge of this thing here. Um, but, and so they can see out, so all the crows always like to have to be up high and see, see for a wide area around them. But now they, but what they didn't realise was that there's the glass wall, there's the nest. This, this is somebody's desk, you know. And so I, he said, this guy from the building I occupied at Griffith University said, come and have a look. And there, there he was. <laughs> this is me just going and saying, people, that's my, there's my precious babies in the nest. And so as a result, when, we, when I, from that moment on, 
Because I went down and went, what are you doing? Have you worked out how to build a nest? You know what nests are for now? Clearly. Um, from that moment on, I and all the other slim, tall males from my building got attacked. <laughs> a la magpies. They knew us backwards. All right. Now that's interesting and very annoying while it lasted. And we're wondering what's going to happen this year. But I contacted all of my Corvid research friends in Australia and around the world and, and said, do you know of how many other crow species build their nests on buildings? None. There is no evidence anywhere. Now, building where, where people are is what I mean. So they build on structures all over the place, but not ever where people are. And then I, so I observed this for a year. I watched the, ba the babies be get raised successfully. I realised that they were really protected from the, from the elements. It wasn't in a tree swaying around in the breeze. Big storms came through. The trees all blew around. The bird's nest blew out. But these guys were really sheltered, really safe, really great place to live. Now, this is, looks like it's the first time. So I actually, I, a journalist I was talking to, journalists always ring me up and say, anything happening and I have to come up. It's been a, Trump hasn't done anything stupid for a while. <laughs> so, they, so they need some, some, a story and I say, oh, well, the crows are nesting on my building. Oh, is that interesting? You know, and I'll explain. And so I made a claim. I've done this all the time. I've made the claim. I think this is the first time that this has ever, you know, happened. And it goes into the newspaper, and the next thing I get is 700 emails from people saying, actually, it's not. But what, so I, I got a huge number of, of uh, emails from the Gold Coast and Queensland, the Gold Coast and Brisbane, and, but they all said approximately the same thing. The crows have been around our area for years. We've seen them nesting nearby. But last year, two years ago, three years ago, they started nesting on the buildings. Something suddenly happened. Now, what's really interesting is all baby, ma all baby birds will treat wherever their nest is as their natal habitat. That's, so when they grow up and find look for a nest site, all of those new baby crows will think buildings are where crows, crows nest. So this is genuinely an evolutionary moment. This is a big change in the behaviour, a really fundamental behaviour. And because it's probably likely to be a successful place for those baby, baby crows to, to be raised, it will spread. So this is, you, you, you heard it from me, it's just happened, a major evolutionary behavioural change in a local bird, and it happened on my building. Because <laughs> a lot of my mates said, how did you organise that? <laughs> so to finish up with, if you're interested in the crows at all, here is my friend John Marslap with one of his books called The Gift of the Crow, uh, and here's Bern Heinrich who studied ravens for years. Both of these guys, so John Marslap and Bern Heinrich, have, they have a whole series of bird, bird books, very easy to read books on all sorts of things to do with birds in general, but especially they've got a whole series on ravens and crows and all sorts of stuff. Thank you very much. Now we've got a little bit of time, and uh, put your hand up, please, and wait for the microphone before you ask your question. Thank you. You uh, implied that we're soon going to be inundated with attack crows as well as attack magpies. Um, I hope not. No, so there, there are crows that do attack people. They do exactly what the magpies do, but they don't ever make contact. They never make contact. They can scare you. But so, I've been studying crow, uh, magpie aggression for years, years and years. And I've noticed that over the last four or five years, maybe even ten years ago was the first time I noticed, that there was the odd report of crows doing the same kind of thing. And that's building up, for sure. But they're not attacking, they're not hurting people. Okay, so this move into buildings is not going to cause more aggression? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I forgot your name. Daryl. Daryl. Yes. Uh, Crows have got a lot on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you talked about uh, the uh, uh, size of uh, corvids or crows, anyway, and ravens' uh, vocabularies and their ability to put equivalent sentences together. Yep. Uh, 
And have you have you or anyone else ever studied magpies and their and their calls? Because magpies are one of my favourite birds. They walk around all the time talking to others or talking to themselves. <laughs> and it sounds like they're talking to yeah. themselves or others and they have an enormous range of calls. No, absolutely. And and, and as I intimated, because of the but baby basically Magpies are just great big butcher birds. Um, that group, which includes, so it's the Cracticidae is the name of the group, but it includes the butcher birds and the Australian magpies and the currawongs. That group, no question, is the next big thing to in investigate. So the caroling of the magpies, that beautiful extended calling that they do in the, in, in dawn, at dawn, which is a terrifyingly dangerous thing for if you're on the magpie, basically means if you come near my place, I will rip you limb from limb. Even though it sounds beautiful. Um, but that's, that's among the most complex bird, com bird songs in the world. That's been teased apart to get all its elements, but we have no idea what it really means. Okay, well I have another little uh, uh, question. Yep. Uh, birds, and I, I don't know how long live crows are, but I imagine... 20 or 30 years, I would have thought. They breed every year. Yep from maturity on. Yep. Uh, has anyone in the world ever thought about raising them in some numbers and trying to force evolution in the short term by teaching, by education and and, and I don't how, think far, need... how far can they go with their intelligence? Yeah, well that, 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 there's now colonies of New Caledonian crows which terrifies me. They're, they're, they're breeding New Caledonian crows with that, that in mind. They're actually pushing them. These, these experiments are like now up to eight, an eight-stage puzzle that they can stu study. CIA. <laughs> well, don't give them any ideas. <laughs> They'll be wearing two little kits. <laughs> Janet, um, if you're talking about crows attacking, mm. uh, a very good friend of mine, she has a lot of trouble with the crows, uh, because they bring the bread into the bird baths yes. and uh, to soften it so they yeah. can eat it. Uh, but she goes out, they put this big piece in, this particular crow put this big piece of bread in there and she went, she hates them coming and dirtying up her bread, her bird bath. Mm. So she took this bread out and was walking with the bread to the house and the crow attacked her. Right. And it kept on attacking her and it pecked her on the top of the head. Really? Well, that's the first time I've heard of that. Yes. He they must have been very un unhappy. Yes, she was very <laughs> sad. He was very upset about right. taking the bread, obviously. Okay. Well, that's actually really worth knowing that because that's the first time I've heard of that sort of extreme reaction. What you can tell her, though, is go to the toy shop and get one of those little Mr. Gumby um, toys and just stick that there and the crows won't go anywhere near it. They are so near that they won't, need, won't go. So it's a, you know that funny little horse toy? Oh, yes. Well, if they put something like that, it doesn't have to be bad. Anything that's weird and colourful and but totally new, they won't go near that bird bath again. Yes, there we go. Do crows, do crows make for life? Yes, they do. Yeah. The crows at my place, so I'm happy to have there, they never get in groups. I've got a, a pair that rule the roost, they raise a young, and if it's, I think if it's male, it gets chased away very quickly. Mm. This last year they must have had females and one of them stayed on for probably five months, but it's now gone. Right. And they will not allow any other crows in the neighbourhood. That's right. So that's absolutely normal. So all crows everywhere, pretty much, occur in their strict pairs. They have a territory that they... But they can't defend a large territory, so they allow other crows to move through their territory. But, or overhead, but primarily the, wherever you live with crows, and this would be exactly the case here, there is like, a, you, can, you can divide up the whole place into crow territories, each one with a pair that raise their chicks, and then the chicks get kicked out of home before the next breeding season, and that's how it is. But of course there's so many other crows, unpaired ones, all the young ones, which take maybe two, two or three years before they pair up, they're the big groups. So when I mentioned those large groups, almost all of those are just the juveniles. 
They're the teenagers with black t-shirts hanging around the supermarket, you know, with their iPhones on, you know. So uh, they move around wherever the food is. So basically there'll be a, a nice, happy couple, and they'll look, oh look who's coming now, it's the gang of, gang of you know, teenagers, and they'll just settle and there's nothing they can do about it. Yeah, so if you're a, if you don't want to, if you're a, a pair of crows, you don't want to live near a schoolyard, because schoolyards, for some reason I can't understand it, really fantastically attractive to crows. Get you my sandwiches on. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Yep. Just a little question. Do crows converse in other languages? Like if you talk an Australian crow to Europe, can he converse straight away with a European? <laughs> well, it, we, I actually... The, the, a bloke put out a thing called The Language of Crows, and he put out a CD, and it was from... Uh, it was hundreds of hours... Well, not hundreds of hours, hundreds of examples of American crow language. It's the most boring CD you could possibly imagine. But I thought, well, we'll give it a shot. So we actually broadcast to the local crows around Brisbane, and they took no notice of it. Um, I'd like to... Uh, I noticed by films that uh, a lot of those crows have abandoned. Yes. Can you train a crow to uh, home? Or... Um, do they home? No, they, they don't really home. They, they live permanently in a territory, and if you took them more than about 30 kilometres away, we've done this, they don't know how to find their way home, so they're not very good homers. They're not like pigeons, not at all. Mm. Thank you. Okay. And therefore, they don't migrate? So no, the, the ones from here want to have moved across to Darwin and then realise I've got to learn behaviour from flipping the cane toes over? No, no, not at all. No. So the only time that a crow moves is when it's young and, and moves away, it needs to find a territory of its own, it needs to find a mate. But so there's no migration. What there is, they sorry? When they're going to find new territories, how far would they go? Two k's, five k's? Oh, 50 k's is about average for, for most Australian crows. Now, what that, that said, um, every, there's lots of places where it's, it's really, in Australia, especially inland Australia, it's really tough. So there is not very, I mean, around here or anywhere along the coast, you know, you can have lots of crow territories because it's really, there's plenty of food. But if you go into where it's dry, the territorial system breaks down pretty much because it's not... So the only place you'll get a crow is near a water source or along a river or, or those sorts of things. So, and those crows, any of those crows, I'll show you the maps for the Australian crows, any of them that live in interior parts of Australia are not migratory, but they're nomadic. And they will move around as conditions change. So if it's a good year um, in central Queensland, they'll just stay put. But if it becomes a prolonged drought for a number of years, I'll say this is a year, we'll just move on to somewhere else which is completely sensible in a place as unpredictable as Australia. Uh, I, I was sitting on the back veranda one afternoon and, and there was a possum screaming around in the, in the gum tree and this crow flew in. Yep. And for nearly an hour, they, the, he, he hassled the possum and attacked it and the possum was fighting the crow. And yep. It was fascinating to watch. Yeah. But I assume that's some sort of territory thing. Or... Well, it's probably... Possums will eat baby birds out of nests, and I think that's that's what it is. I've seen that to the extent where the crow got a ring-tailed possum, which I'm absolutely sure would never eat a baby bird, and they and it was a whole bunch of crows, and they forced it out onto a, a limb and eventually fell off and fell onto the road and died. So I think it's just an extreme keep a predator away kind of reaction. It's not allowed to have another... Uh, It'll cost you. <laughs> I just wanted to say... Um, with with the uh, disappearance of so much sugar cane on the coast, it's really it really affected the crows when it all when the, when the sugar cane uh -huh. disappeared yes. because they were intelligent enough enough to know when the fires went through. Yeah. If they waited on the outside, they would get all the little creatures that were running out of the the burning cane. Yes, absolutely. So they lost a lot of. Um, ways of getting food in yeah. the cave. No, that's a, good, a very good point, absolutely. This is a pretty elementary question, but what makes a corvid a corvid? What, what have they got? In, they seem so different in characteristics. What? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, 
there, there will be some technical reasons why you're a Corbett and not a Corbett. There's not many things that are closely related to Corbett. They're pretty much by themselves. So lots of, lots of species, you, it's, it's hard to decide whether to put it into the, that group or that group, but there's nothing quite like a crow or a Corbett. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Here in Wallace Park, the pied currawongs have nested on the building over here. Ah, oh, okay, yes. Do you think the crows have learnt from the pied currawongs how to nest on buildings? As I've said, you should be aware that I think they would learn from everything. They learn, they watch us, they learn other, they're obviously watching other species do all sorts of things, so that's perfectly a possibility. Yeah. Oh, Darrell, um, given that the crows don't migrate or move around very much, how do you think the, the cultural exchange, particularly related to crows, uh, would have travelled from South East Queensland? Well, no, it, so um, that knowledge would have been available to the birds right up near... The, 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 so the crows continued all the way through, and as the as the cane toads moved, they would have that knowledge would have moved with the cane toads. So it wasn't as though the first by the time that they the cane toads reached um, Darwin, that would have been just progressive change, progressive learning from from the crows all the way along. So it wouldn't have been there wouldn't have been no gaps in it. And learning by observation, not, yes. not by language, could they transfer the knowledge? That's a big, I think it would have been just by observation. You know. Because one thing, is, one thing is for sure, one thing is absolutely for sure, anybody who, who studies crows or spends any time looking at crows, they are really observant. Yeah, I, so many times I've been, ooh, somebody's looking at me and there's a crow just watching what I'm doing. You know? They'll just be, what's this guy up to? Is there any food involved? Can I, you know, just, is he doing something dangerous? Should I be aware? They're just really, 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 really observant, watching all the time. Um. The crows nest uh, in groups because my, my tree by my house there are two crow nests. Do they do that a lot? And why, if they're so clever, do they do the um, the cuckoos make in their nest? Oh uh, well, cuckoos are very very clever they as well. Clever. <laughs> well, they've got to be particularly clever, but to out, out with with a crow. But the channel bill cuckoos, yeah, they're. they're there's an increasing number of channel bill cookers because there's an increasing number of crows, so that's that's going on all the time. That's yeah, that's I tried to study that, but that's too hard, you know. I just don't know what's going on. But you know, every cooker in the world has to be able to deceive, they have to be able to sneak in when the when the parents are not there, take an egg out, lay their egg and get out of there in about two seconds. So they're all capable of doing that. I it, I think it's just an instinctual instinctual thing. Yeah, the other story I can add to you of recognising a face, they recognise feet too. It was, I, had, I used to have, when I was in New Zealand, I had a pet magpie. Right. And my husband, we uh, stopped the stage and agent to come along and they lean on the car to have a chat, you know, like right. they do. And the magpie would shoot through from the other side of the car and beat bite, bite the visitor on the feet. <laughs> <laughs> and he never did it to my husband. <laughs> so you can add feet to the face. <laughs> Yeah, it's getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> uh, just to, re, um, you know, to reinforce what you were saying about crows recognising traps, uh, many years ago I had a, a sorghum seed crop up at Kuya north of Crow's Nest on right. the Dalek Downs. It was a little three acre field. And the seed was really important to the company. Right. And the crows were eating it, you know, mm. starting at the beginning of the row and just moving along, moving along. And uh, I decided one night to ambush them. So at midnight, I drove up there with the shotgun. And without a torch, you know, just by using starlight, found my way out into the middle of the field, lay down, slept the night with the shotgun, woke up in the morning, thought, I'm going to scare the crap out of you guys. Right, they knew I was there. They didn't come near me. They went to the other end of the field and carried on feeding. So they are so, so smart. Well, to me, that would be a classic example of neophobia. What's this guy doing? They, you know, how would they see me? Well, how would they see you? Yeah, there's something going on there. But let me just say, don't try out smart crap. Yeah. <laughs>
I think that's all the time we've got for questions today. Sorry, Barry. But I'm sure Daryl won't mind staying around. No, it's a few fine. people who have questions uh, they'd like to ask on a one-to-one. -one. But I'd like to at this point say thank you ever so much once again, Daryl. And I, I look forward to chatting to you. Don't run away. So we can set up a date for your book launch. Sure. Because uh, thank you all like to come to here. Thank you. means of saying thank you very much for Ms. Parks. We would like to present you with a little book about Noosa and Kalua Coast and uh, hope that you'll enjoy reading that and look forward to your coming back again. Thanks very much. Thank you very so much.